Amen. We want to continue worshiping as we turn to the ministry of the word and we continue in our sermon series, Embracing Worship Tensions. And I know from conversations I've had this week that thoughts have been provoked, people have been challenged by this series, and I I trust that that will continue today as we open God's word together. We'll be looking at Psalm 150, the final psalm in that book. So you can read along with me, Psalm 150. Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens, praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Love so amazing so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Lord, we bring you this morning our souls and our lives and everything we have, and we lay them at your feet, recognizing that even those are an offering far too small for you, the one who created us, the one who has redeemed our lives from the pit, the one who has given us a hope and a future. Oh Lord, we praise you this morning with everything that we have. And Lord, now I pray that you would accept the praise of our minds and our ears this morning as we receive your word, as we meditate on it, as we allow it to penetrate into our hearts, that you would do your work by your Holy Spirit in it through the word preached. And bless your messenger this morning as he brings your word. And Lord, I pray that you would build us into a people who praises you more sincerely, loves you more wholeheartedly. Lord, help us as we receive the word this morning with sincere hearts that love you and praise you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Just thinking about that line, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small to give to our God. My prayer for us in this worship series and every week of worship is that we would be so captivated by the glory of God that we would, that our hearts would be pained when we realize just how great he is and just how small is our praise and our worship But not that we would be discouraged by that, but that we would be stirred to say, this kind of love demands my soul, my life, my all. Well, we're talking about embracing worship tensions again today. And this whole series is really premised on this idea that if we don't embrace the biblical tensions of worship as they're set out for us in the Bible, then tension will grow up in the church of the unbiblical sort. So our aim in this series is to go back to what does the scripture say about worship and to embrace the tensions we find there in order that we might worship the Lord rightly and also keep at bay the unbiblical tensions that arise in a church that loses its focus on the right things. Brian Chappell in his book, Christ-Centered Worship, puts it this way. He says, if gospel priorities do not determine worship choices, then people's preferences will tear the church apart. The variety of style possibilities combined with the usual mix of personalities, generations, newcomers, and old-timers will put church leaders under constant pressure to adjust worship. If personal preferences are allowed to call the shots then worship tensions of the unhealthy sort will be unavoidable. So the aim of this series and of what we're trying to do is to 
put gospel priorities in front of you and to root our worship in the priorities that are set forth in the scripture, rooted in the gospel and for the sake of the gospel so that we can keep these unhealthy worship tensions at bay that tend to arise when we as leaders start trying to listen to the voices of a thousand different people from a thousand different backgrounds with a thousand different personal preferences. We're saying that the gospel and its priorities are our priorities in worship. And we're inviting everybody to get on board with the gospel's project for us and for the world. Amen? Amen. That's an exciting place of worship. So we're talking about the tensions. We looked the first week at the tension between awe and celebration. There are some who feel like worship should be characterized by a sense of awe and reverence. And and when you walk into this room, you should shut your mouth. And you you should be tempted to fall on your face before the presence of God and say, woe is me, for I am undone. And you ought not be smiling and chatting it up with your neighbors when you walk into the room. There are other people who say, If Christ is risen from the dead and he reigns on high and my salvation is secured, purchased, and full and final, then we ought not look like death warmed over when we come to worship. (laughs) And, And both of these are right. This is exactly what the scripture says. When we come into worship, we should be in awe of the presence of the holy God and likewise hearts filled with joy and overflowing with celebration because Christ is risen. How in the world did one keep those two things together? The answer is is the the cross. At the gospel, there we find the holiness and the transcendence of God and the sinfulness of man. But there also we find the grace of God that flows freely to every sinner who believes. Reverence and joy. One place at the cross. We saw in the second week that, that... There are some who feel like worship should be rooted in the scriptures and in the great traditions of of history and that we need to be tied and and rooted there deeply. And and, and so what if it doesn't communicate with with people today? So what if the kids don't like it? So what if we're, we're to be rooted? And there are others who say on the other side, it should be relevant. And who cares what the church has been doing for 2,000 years? What matters is that we're communicating to people today and reaching a lost world out there. And if we're not speaking their language, they're not going to hear the message. And biblically, you're both right. We should be rooted in the faith once for all delivered and handed down through the ages from our forefathers and mothers in the faith, starting with the scriptures and passed down. And the one whose heart is most deeply gripped by that faith once for all delivered and passed down is the one most eager to make that message relevant for the people around them today because they want to share it. And I know that if I'm speaking Chinese and you don't speak Chinese, you're not getting that faith once delivered that I want you to have. Rooted and relevant. Gospel priorities, a once for all unchanging message that finds expression in many different cultures around the world. And we want to do that just as the scriptures call us to. And then last week we talked about the tension of where is worship to affect us personally? There are some who feel like worship is primarily an intellectual exercise. It's, it should, I should come here and be mentally, intellectually challenged by what happens here. Make me think. And there are others who say, the last thing I want to do when I come in here is think. I want my soul to be touched. I want my heart affected. I want to be moved. And then there are others who say, You guys are both wrong. It's all about the stuff. It's about doing the stuff. You know, what happens here is here or there, but what matters is that we're walking out of these doors and we're living changed lives of of worship in our our acts and our deeds and our words. And when we go to the scripture, what do we find? Yes, (laughs) all of this. Yes, when we come to worship, our minds should be fortified by the truth as it's set out for us in the scripture. We should be stretched to comprehend the magnitude of God and the gospel. And when that happens, rightly, our hearts and souls should be stirred, our affections moved. And actually, that moves our bodies into action, both in worship and beyond. 
heart, soul, mind, strength, we're called to love the Lord our God. So today we're asking one more question, looking at one more tension. And the question really, which could have been the first question in this series, but we've saved it for last. And the question is, who is worship for? This seems to be the most fundamental of all of the questions. Who is worship for anyway? Now let me just pause for a moment and recognize that not all of you who are here today are already followers of Jesus. There's some of you here who know you're not followers of Jesus, and you're just here, you're, you're interested, a friend invited you, or you just, you just wanted to come and see what it's all about, and we're glad that you've come to hear this. There are others of you who aren't sure whether or not you're a Christian. There are others of you who are in some place along the journey you're exploring and so on. And, uh, this, this is a message primarily for the church and for those who follow Jesus, but it's important that you hear this because you won't often hear people talking about worship. We do a lot of worshiping, but we don't often stop and step back and ask ourselves, what is it exactly that we're doing when we worship? And so this is a great conversation for you to sit on who are just wondering about the Christian faith and what it's all about. So who then is worship for? Now, most anybody in here would probably say, if I asked you that question, who is worship for? You would say God, I hope. And if you said that, you'd be right. That is who worship is for. Worship is for God. And that's a fundamental basic principle that pretty much everybody understands. But it's amazingly difficult to keep that truth in the forefront of our minds when we actually come to worship. You see, what happens is we forget that worship is first for God. And we suddenly slip into thinking that it's actually for me. And it's actually about me. And when we lose that priority of the fact that this is for him, well, some of those unbiblical tensions we were talking about before begin to show their ugly head. But that raises the question, well, is there any legitimate sense in which worship is actually for the people of God who have come to worship him? Is worship for us in any way? And the answer, according to some, is no. It's for him, not for you. And so if you don't appreciate what's going on, if you don't like it, if, you don't, if you're not engaged and so on, sorry about your luck. It's for him. Well, what we find in the scripture is that worship is for God, but it's very much intentionally for the church. And when we worship God according to biblical priorities and embracing the right biblical tensions we've been talking about, then the effect of it is that it does serve to build up the church. So it's for the church. Well, that raises the question, well, is, is there any sense in which worship is for the people who aren't part of the church already? Is worship for the world in any kind of way? Some would say, no way. It's for God. It's for the church. And if the unbelievers who happen to be present don't get anything out of it, well, of course they don't. They're unbelievers. Is there any legitimate sense in which the church is for the world? Some say no. Others go to the opposite extreme. And they say, Everything that we do in here should be done for the sake of the unbeliever who happens to be present. In fact, one of the largest churches in America that's doing a ton of good work, and I do not intend to criticize their work, just simply to, to point out their very philosophy of ministry is to create a church that unchurched people love to attend. So that orders their priorities about how they go about their worship services. And that's going to shape how you go about doing a number of things. Is worship in any sense for the world? We'll say this morning that yes, it is, and we're going to talk about later on exactly how that works. But these are some of the questions we're going to be unpacking as we go forward. So let me just start with the principle, then we're going to work it out and help you understand what the implications of this are for us and our worship. Here it is. Biblical worship is for the Lord, for the church, and for the world in that order. Biblical worship is for the Lord, for the church, and for the world in that order. So you see the tension holding these three things together, but in this tension, there is also an order of priority that must also be kept in its appropriate place. And if any of these things get out of order, if any things are left out of the tension altogether, then our worship is going to be something less than what the scripture describes and what we're called to actually give when we come to worship. So let's talk about these then in order. First of all, worship is for the Lord. John Piper in his classic book, Let the Nations Be Glad, a book on missions, says this. 
Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. This is a beautiful statement. We here at Covenant, you will often hear us say, we are a missions church, and we are. But what you need to understand is that we are a missions church because we are first a worshiping church. And what drives our mission is that we want to see more worshipers. We don't exist for mission. We exist for worship. We do mission so that more people will worship. That's what drives a large mission budget. That we understand that if the whole realm of nature were ours to give praise to our God, it's not enough. We need more people praising God. And so we send missionaries. And so we go about our daily work proclaiming the good news and sharing Christ, desiring more people to praise this God that we love. The chief end of man Not the chief end of Christians. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Whether you're a Christian or not, you exist to worship, to praise, to behold, to reflect, to declare the glories of the God who made you. And where we don't see that happening as a church... We go on mission, and we seek to help facilitate that. Well, why do we praise God? Why do we worship him? Well, first of all, why is biblical worship for the Lord? Because he commands it. He commands it. We can't overlook this simple fact. We worship God because he commands us to. Psalm 150, verse 1 says, praise the Lord. Hebrew is one word. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's an invitation. It's a command. It's an expectation that you will praise him. Christian and non-Christian alike, sentient beings and rocks alike, praise him. He's the maker. Is this just for the people of God? Of course not. Psalm 117.1 reminds us, Issues the call. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. Everyone, wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever background you come from, join us in this all creation song of praise to the maker and to the one who through his death has ransomed, has bought a people for himself. Praise him. Everybody, praise him. According to Ronald Allen, praise is a choice, not a feeling. We are not to praise the Lord only when we feel warm and fuzzy inside. We are to praise him even in our most troubled moments, for even during those times, he is still our God. And I would add, he is still worthy of praise. And you are still created to praise him. So praise him. He commands it. Praise him. He calls you to it. He made you for it. Praise him, oh people. Here's what that means for you. It means when you come to the worship service, which is marked by praise, praise the Lord. Praise it. This is the most practical, applicative message you've ever heard. Praise the Lord. You remember the message Pastor Brent gave a number of weeks back on what it means to praise. Praise him. That's what we're called to do. It means when it's time to sing his praises, that to have a physical posture of this. How much longer does this go? When do we get to the real stuff? Why does the church sing for 20 minutes? Isn't one song sufficient? That's falling short of what God calls us to. Full-throated praise. 
He commands it, don't you see? For you to not engage in praising him, and I'm not just talking about in here all of life, but, but here, let's just narrow it down. For you to not praise him is you're, you're rebelling against your maker. He says, praise him. You're saying, I'm not going to. And that's a serious issue. It's, it's sin. And it calls for repentance. That means to turn away from not giving him the praise he deserves and to begin to praise him because he's your maker and king. Praise him. It means that we don't want to slip into less than biblical forms of worship where we're trusting the paid people up here to do your worshiping and praising for you. Your call is to praise him. That's not an outsourceable role. <laughs> Nobody can praise him for you. You praise him. He commands it. Secondly, we praise him because he deserves it. He deserves it. Listen to 150 verse 2. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. He deserves praise. If he didn't deserve it, but he commands it, well, he's still the king, but he deserves your praise because of his excellent greatness and his mighty deeds. We sang at the beginning, all creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. What? what? Who cares if all the rest of creation praises him? I'll tell you who cares. The heart that is consumed with a vision of the glory of God. That heart says, if God's glory extends through all of the universe, then his praise must extend that far as well. I can't be satisfied when God is not honored and glorified. I want every rock, I want every blade of grass, I want every bird in the sky, every mouth on this earth, every tongue, every seashell and grain of sand to give praise to this God. And even that still is not enough to satisfy the heart. I've seen a vision of a God who would step down and bear the cross for your sin. You can't be content Peter Bowler lived a lot of years ago. He, he, he once said this statement to his friend. He said, if I had a thousand tongues, I would praise Christ with them all. Does that make any sense to you? Have you ever been so captivated by God and his goodness and his worthiness that you just are led to say something spontaneous like that. If I had a thousand tongues, I would use every single one to praise Christ. He is so infinitely worthy. He's so infinitely deserving. Were all the realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small to you. Have you yet seen him in his glory and his goodness and his graciousness to such a degree that you're like, I just, I wish I had more tongues. I wish I had more songs. I wish I had more time. I wish I had more worshipers. I wish, I wish because he's so worthy. If not, then labor to be affected by the cross. Consider what he's done. Survey the wondrous cross until your heart is moved and stirred. Don't wait for somebody else to do that for you. Labor in the word and the truth of the gospel till your hard heart is melted. Well, he happened to mention that to Charles Wesley, who, you know, while in the process of writing his 8,989 songs, thought that, was, that will sing. So he wrote, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. My great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. That's a heart that's been affected by the cross. He got it. When Peter said that, he's like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. A thousand tongues to sing his glories and his wonders, the trophies of his grace. When you read through the Psalms, you get the feeling they're frustrated by this very thing. 
They've been captured by the worthiness of God's praise and glory, and they're frustrated. Listen, Psalm 146 says, I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. As long as I have breath, I'm going to praise him. As long as I continue to exist, I'm going to give him praise because he's infinitely worthy of it. With every breath till the end, I'm going to praise him. Psalm 113, verse 3. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. He's not talking about hours of the day. He's talking about from the east to the west. As far as the expanse is the east to the west, let the name of the Lord be praised. Exclude nobody. We want everybody joining this creation song to the king who's worthy. And my personal mission is to see that it happen. And that's why you have these movements of people through the ages who say, to lay down in my life in death to see people praise God is no sacrifice at all. There's nothing for which I could give my life for more worthy than to see him praised by just one more tongue, one more life. In Psalm 150 here, you you get the sense of of frustration that there's just not enough instruments in the world to praise him. Listen, verse 3, praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. (laughs) All the Presbyterians and Baptists in the room going, I don't think that's really in there. (laughs) All the Pentecostals are like, finally. (laughs) All the kids are like, (laughs) I don't know if God's glorified by flossing, so don't do it, kids. Don't do it. He goes on, praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. And then he's just like, he just gives up. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Everything. Everything. You see, as you you look at this list of instruments here, by the way, I tell you, some of our Reformed forefathers and mothers in the faith who we've learned from and love and appreciate were just wrong when they said you should not use instruments in worshiping God. If you believe what's called the regulative principle of worship, that we should worship according to what the Scripture says, then what the Scripture says is that you should praise Him with trumpet sound, with strings, with harps, with lutes, with cymbals, loud clashing ones even, and dance when it's appropriate. We're committed to the word at Covenant Church. This is what the word says. This is what we, we want to do. And so you'll find here that, 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 that brass in worship is an appropriate expression of praise for God, that, that lute and harp, stringed instruments, pianos, guitars, basses, whatever, violins, all of this, they're to be used in the praise of God, tambourines, pipes like an organ, sounding cymbals and loud clashing cymbals. These are all to be used. You see, this is not a person who is concerned about instrumentation in worship. What is his concern? His concern is the glory of God. And if there's a noisemaker out there that I can find and turn into an instrument of praise to him, I want it used to praise him. Is that your heart for worship? To praise God, to say there's no, I, if everything, I want everything turned to his praise. Use everything to praise him. He deserves it. If you were to follow the scriptures from the Old to the New Testament and study this theme of worship, you'll discover there that central to worship is sacrifice, an offering. In the Old Testament, they were bringing the blood of goats and bulls, and they were bringing uh, offerings of grain and other kinds of stuff, they, they, but they were bringing offerings. When you get to the New Testament, you discover that still, Offering and sacrifice is an important component of worship, though it changes somewhat. The, the sacrifice of the please God or the sacrifice of praise and sharing what you have with others and doing good works and trusting in the once-for-all sacrifice of Christ. These are the kinds of sacrifices. But, but central to worship across the scriptures is the idea of bringing an offering for the Lord. But somewhere along the way, we got mixed up and twisted. 
Marva Don, who's written a book called uh, Reaching Out Without Dumbing Down, she says, people began attending worship to receive a blessing rather than to make an offering. Those are two different approaches to worship. She said, this destructive change is intertwined with the relegation of worshipers to a passive role, where basically you become the audience for the professional worshipers. She goes on and says, if they had no demand upon them besides attendance and monetary offerings, the true nature of the gift of worship was lost. All anticipation related to worship came to center on what could be received from an experience, whether or not the music was inspiring, the lessons were edifying, the sermon was exciting, rather than on what should be expended during a service. So the mindset changed from what can I bring and expend in the service of the worship of my God to what can I expect to receive when I come to church today? Well, brothers and sisters, that simply won't do for Covenant Church because we're going to keep the priority where it belongs, that worship is first and foremost for the Lord. And so we've been encouraging over the last four weeks, when you come to worship, come prepared to bring an offering, to bring a sacrifice of praise, to bring a gift to him of, of money. It's the, it's the, it's the gift of a, of a week lived in dependence upon him. It's the gift of a heart that's labored to be affected by the cross. It's the gift of maybe struggling to learn some new songs so that you can fully engage when you get here to worship on Sunday morning. Come to bring an offering. When we don't come with that perspective, then we begin to slip into thinking about church being something that's primarily there for us to receive something. And what happens is if we're not receiving what we think we should get, then we just decide we'll check out. If you're not gonna song the things, you're not gonna sing the songs that I like, I'm just not gonna come. Or I'm just gonna skip that part. Or what we want to do is recognize that this is for him. And so we want to evaluate our worship and the components of our worship and say, is this something that, that honors him? And if it honors him, then, then whether or not it's my personal preference or not is really a secondary matter. Is, are my brothers and sisters engaged? Are we together bringing something with one voice to the Lord that honors him? And if so, that's what I'm here for. And what happens when we approach worship with that kind of a mindset is that we do find, even if it's not our preferences, that we do receive a blessing. But the order is important. If we come seeking the blessing rather than to bring an offering, then we'll often walk away without either. So worship is for the Lord. But worship is also for the church. So let's talk about that. Biblical worship is for the church. Bob Coughlin, who we quoted a number of times in this series, Worship Pastor, he says that worship is God's gift of grace to us before it's our offering to God. Worship is God's gift of grace to us before it's our offering to God. So when we come, we're bringing an offering, but it's God's gift to us that we get to come and to bring him an offering. Our worship is a response to his grace. And to his call, that's why we start with that call to worship. It's a reminder every week that it's him calling us to come and worship him. It's our gift that we get to come and bring him a gift. Worship is for God's people. Now, Psalm 150 verse 1 says, praise him in the sanctuary. This is an expectation that God's people are going to come together in a corporate context to praise him together with one voice as we do when we gather in worship. When we continue into the time of the New Testament church, we find that they're still doing the same thing. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing each other in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts toward God. Now, what happens when God's people gather together and we're singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and we're teaching and admonishing one another in the context of community, what happens is they're not only offering God a, a gift and an offering, but it, the effect of it is that it serves to edify and build up the church. Here's how. 
First, when we gather to worship in this way, in worship, we remember who he is. In worship, we remember who he is. When we sing the songs that you've been singing this morning, when we open the scripture and read what it says, when we remind each other out in the hallways and we pray for each other, what we're doing is we're reminding each other who our God is. He's the maker of all. He's the creator. He's the one who existed before all time and who exists outside and beyond time. He's the one who spoke all things into existence, who created you and knows you intimately, your deepest thought, from whom you can never run. He's the one who is infinitely good and perfect, who is excellent in all of his greatness. He's the one who... And on and on it goes. And when we gather for worship and we sing his praises, we remember who he is, and that has a positive impact on who we are. When I'm worried and I come into worship and I begin to sing about the power of Almighty God and His wisdom, my worry begins to dissipate. And on and on it goes. In worship, we remember who He is, and that builds us up. It strengthens us. When we sing these songs, we're not only singing them to the Lord, but to each other. We remember the truth. Secondly, in worship, we remember what He's done. We come, we gather, we sing, we preach, we proclaim, we share. This is the one who bore our sin. He bore our shame through his work and what he has done. We stand before God and know that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We remember that our sins have taken as far as the east is from the west from us. We know that as a father has compassion on his children, so does our father have compassion on us. We remember what he's done, that he's defeated sin and Satan, that through his resurrection, death is defeated, waiting its final victory when he raises us from the dead. But as we remember what he's done, we are built up in this grace in which we stand. It strengthens the church. And then thirdly, in worship, we remember what he will do. He said that he's coming again. He said that when he comes again, he's going to wipe away every tear from every eye. He said that when he comes again, he's going to make every wrong thing right. Not one wrong will be left unrighted. That he will bring justice and righteousness. That he will perfect us as he raises us from the dead and transforms us, glorifies us in a glorified new creation. This is what he said it will do. And and so when we gather in worship and we sing these truths and we proclaim and we share them, it has a positive impact on us. We do receive a blessing. We're strengthened. We're built up. This is the effect of biblical worship for the church. And so we gather and we do it. And we keep the gospel priorities at the center because when it's first for him and it's about him, then we find ourselves edified and built up. Thirdly, worship, biblical worship is for the world. Biblical worship is for the world. I mentioned earlier this uh, vision that one particular church has where they're seeking to create a church that unchurched people love to attend. Now, this is a church that's very effective, as you would expect, at reaching the unchurched, and they're doing a lot of good work by pursuing that particular philosophy. But, but, but without some checks and balances, that philosophy can lead you to pull back from some of the important central aspects of what worship is supposed to be. A friend shared with me a quote that I think puts the matter into perspective. This is what it says. Say I walked into an animal sacrifice ritual for some pagan religion. If they're doing their job right, I should be uncomfortable and disturbed because I don't believe their religion. I think their gods are foolish and their rituals are evil. Yet we want unbelievers to be comfortable and entertained as we approach the one true holy God by means of his sacrificed and resurrected son. Either Christ is a stumbling block or he's your king. We need to stop dressing him up like a jester. He's not here for your entertainment. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, he's here as the king in his radiant glory and the grace that he extends to everyone who believes. But he's not here to entertain you or to make us feel comfortable. The cross is a very challenging message in your face. That that cross is about your sin and it's about your rebellion. And if you continue on in it, then that cross is your end. 
But if you trust in Christ and what that cross represents, then yes, there is divine comfort available to you through it. But if you spurn that cross and what it represents, then there is divine wrath that is coming and it should feel uncomfortable. A church that welcomes believer and unbeliever alike is a church that's a loving family, that treats all people with respect and love and care, that forbears with one another, that puts one another ahead of themselves, that that outdoes one another in seeking to show honor. That's the kind of church where the world will come in and see, and those who don't know Jesus yet will come in and see those kind of people, and that will be compelling because it's hard to find outside of Christian community. But to make others comfortable, we never want to pull back that message of the cross because worship is first and foremost about him. And it's about building up the church. And at the center of that is the cross. And and as we hold up the cross at the center, that is a message that both draws and repels the unbeliever. For those whom God is calling, they're drawn in by the cross of Jesus to put their trust in him. And for those who are not, they are repelled by it. Tim Keller helpfully summarizes this, I think, when he says, if the Sunday service aims primarily at evangelism, it will bore the saints. And there have been some large church models that have followed that approach, and that's exactly what they found. If it aims primarily at education, it will confuse the unbelievers. But if it aims at praising the God who saves by grace, it will both instruct insiders and challenge outsiders. Good corporate worship will be naturally evangelistic. You see, because it's the message of the cross that believer and unbeliever alike needs every single week. That for all who will trust and rest in Jesus, there is abounding grace for the worst of us sinners. There is a new start. There is a new life that is eternal and free if you'll only believe and trust him. And that invitation, we want to go out every week. So brothers and sisters, I want to conclude with these words from John Piper, again, the same book. He says, the reason God seeks our praise is not because he won't be complete until he gets it. He's seeking our praise because we won't be happy until we give it. Missions is calling the world to do what they were created to do, namely to enjoy making much of Christ forever. As we talk about embracing worship tensions, we're calling and inviting you to enjoy making much of Christ forever according to what he lays out for us in his word. Reverence and awe, joy and celebration rooted in the scriptures and in the truth of the gospel and history relevant for the world today. The head, with the heart, with the hands as we order it for him first to build up the body second and to proclaim good news to the world third. God help us to be this kind of worshiping church. Amen. Amen. Let's pray to him. Lord Jesus, we never want to lose our way. May the cross be our compass. Lead us to your throne week after week, day after day, year after year. Bring us back to the throne of grace where everyone who believes will find mercy peace, rest, meaning, and purpose. Make us worshipers, the very kind you're seeking. Make us those kind of worshipers who worship you in spirit and in truth from our heads and our hearts and through our hands. In every part of life, we want to worship you for you are worthy. Give us a greater vision of your greatness and goodness and grace that we would be discontent with our praise that we would long to have more, to give more, to bring more, to involve more, to, to give you something, Lord, that begins to approximate your infinite value and worth. Stir our hearts and affections, Lord, that we would bring everything and with everything bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.